Oculus Quest, $399. Nice, I think I might get one of those. Oh man, I can't wait for the Quest 2. And it's $100 more affordable. Even cheaper, I'm upgrading ASAP. Oh man, oh man, oh man, as long as it's around 400 bucks. And it's available for pre-order starting today for $14.99. Aw, oh, Let's talk about that very, very steep price tag on the MetaQuest Pro. So I predict that the little internal facing camera on the Quest Pro is going to make Meta way, way more money than the $15 billion they spent last year on the Metaverse. So you might think that I'm gonna justify that comment based on advertising because that's Facebook's bread and butter. What is my purpose? You pass butter. And don't get me wrong, I know that there is gonna be billions of dollars in value from knowing where our eyes look when we're in the metaverse. Advertisers certainly want that data and I'm sure Facebook will happily sell that to them. Oh my God. But there is something that's a little more subtle and often overlooked that I think will have a bigger impact on Meta's bottom line that I wanna talk about in this video. And that is expressive avatars. Hi guys, my 3D avatar is ready for use in my phone or VR. Oh, that didn't make sense? Let me explain. For millions of years, humans have looked each other in the eye and we've noticed really subtle things about smiles and eyebrows and body language because we're trying to gauge the true intentions of the person that we're interacting with. So much of this kind of communication is considered to be true signaling because it helps lead to trust with the people that we surround ourselves with. And emotions like joy, sadness, and disgust, they just emote from us. Babies are born with the ability to recognize and feel comforted by a kind mother's face. And even the most skilled liars as adults, they're going to struggle to fake sincerity for long periods of time. So there is a hidden and incalculatable value, something that is worth its weight in gold, when you take, take facial, facial expressions, expressions and you connect them instantly, instantly and seamlessly to the face of an avatar. avatar. So I call it a hidden value because for decades we have lived without it. Sadly, as a society, we've pretty much gotten used to the constant anxiety and frustration that comes from typos and faux pas, the apologies that come along with emails and text messages, Zoom chats, Tinder swipes, be real, stitches, duets, all of that stuff. It's awkward, it's asynchronous, it's not how humans evolved to communicate. But it doesn't have to be that way much longer. Because I predict that five years from now, virtual avatars are gonna raise their eyebrows and roll their eyes in disgust when they think back to the email inbox. Ooh, ooh, <laughs> oh, I like this. I predict that groups of virtual avatars in the future are gonna be on virtual beaches in front of virtual bonfires, throwing virtual printers and virtual laptops in, and together, these virtual coworkers will dance and laugh and reminisce about the old days. And their virtual avatar will reflect that joy to all the other avatars present because, that's right, eye and face tracking in real time. This is gonna bring social dating to a whole new level in virtual reality. Like, hey, how are you? And the person looks at him like, how you doing? I'm really excited to see you. <laughs> Creep him the freak out. <laughs> I'm gonna start doing that. MetaQuest Pro is expensive because it needs to collect highly detailed and very important information about the way our face and our eyes move so that they can train their AI systems in the future as well as to render those highly detailed virtual avatars to our eyes so that we can truly communicate in the way that humans were meant to. For better or worse, these headsets are gonna collect highly detailed information about our face, the orientations of our head, and they're gonna do it across millions of people who buy this device and wear these as they travel through the metaverse. You pair that up with the information about where they are in the metaverse and what they're interacting with, and you have an incredibly unique data set. And when you also have the supercomputers and the AI expertise, the future can come faster for you than it can for any of your competitors. I mean, that's the data that's needed for these next generation machine intelligence systems to make virtual avatars. Now with legs. Probably the most requested feature on our roadmap. Legs. 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 And now with legs. 
And honestly, I think it's hard to overstate just how natural that kind of communication would feel, even if there is a small, say, a few frame rate delay in the way our eyebrows move, or the avatars don't really look human because they're in the uncanny valley, you know, like where something feels kind of not human, but kind of human, and it feels awkward. Even those stepping stones that we might not solve right away, I still think will give us close enough to the interaction of the way our ancestors and real life works that we're gonna find it much more immersive and much more convenient to spend a lot of hours in there. Okay, so to pull off the whole face tracking system, there's multiple layers. There's some that's in the cloud, there's some that's on board on the headset, and then there's the camera, which is going to be tracking the movement of your eyes, your eyebrows, your lips, your teeth, and your cheeks. Ultra hard eye tracking challenge TikTok edition. She's pretty, so. No, oh, she's, she's got a good stomach. No, no stomachs over her. Her stomach there. looks like mine. Oh. <laughs> Stop. Then that data is fed into a small onboard neural network, a little piece of software that is recognizing those kind of inputs and translating them in to the parts of the avatar that need to mimic what's happening from the camera's point of view. And that brings me to what's called a rigging. So when you have an avatar, you might think that there's nothing below it. It's just like a 3D object. But rigging is the process of actually putting bones and muscle underneath an avatar so that when you move them to where the muscle moves with the bone and then that moves the cheek. So if you look at a movie like Toy Story or a movie like Cars, they're CGI, but the way you get the face is to feel right. The way you get people to express and emote is actually very complicated because there's layers underneath the skin that are also virtual, they're also digital, but they actually are meant with physics simulations to do things in the way our real face would. So the avatars of the future and some of the newest ones out there have some of this rigging in their face. If you want this experience, you have to both have advanced hardware tracking, like something in here, a camera that watches your face, and you have to have it connected properly to a system that can convert it into a character that is rigged to actually express what you're expressing. And oh, how I wish I could demo it for you, but uh, that's, oh geez, that just break? Not covering, I'm not covering comfort in this video. As a channel that has only 100 subscribers, I'm not exactly on Meta's like top list of people to send these devices to. And that brings us to our sponsor, which is nobody yet, because we're too small. But we got a lot of faith we're gonna grow. Now, back to the video. Since I can't demo it myself, let me read to you what a tech blogger named Ben Lang described when he had an experience wearing Meta's new Quest Pro and he was using an app where he was in the metaverse looking into a mirror. So he was testing his facial expressions to see you know, what the mirror could digitally represent. So here's Ben's description. I came away really impressed that with no special calibration, the face I saw in the mirror seemed to mimic whatever motions I could think to make with my face. I was especially drawn to the detail in the skin. If I squinted and scrunched up my nose, I could see the skin around it bunch up realistically. And the same thing when I raised my brow. And it's these subtle details, like the creases in the cheeks moving with the mouth, that really add a lot to the impression that this is not just an object in front of me, but something that's got a living being behind it. Now let's talk about Meta's virtuous cycle, because this is where the sort of special sauce in the maneuvers that they're making compared to the other competitors are. So the Oculus One and the Oculus Two, these are basically just glorified cell phones. You take the Snapdragon chip out of this and you throw it in a phone, and this could be like a Google Pixel, right? It's not, it's not really truly special and unique except for the form factor. But the reason why I really do believe that the Quest Pro is a complete game changer, if they, if they really get some mass adoption, is because there is a virtuous cycle behind that system that you just won't see with this kind of a device. And the conceptual difference is an order of magnitude difference. It doesn't show up in the specs between a regular Oculus Quest 1 or 2 and the Oculus Pro. So let me explain. So every once in a while, some tech companies get in this position that really, really, really helps if you're an investor or you work at the company, where they build a piece of hardware where the customer actually pays for the hardware, the customer also provides the data that they need to then make an update to the software, improve the experience, and then they sell that improved experience back to the consumer. So the consumer both pays for the privilege to give up their data and then pays again for the product that the company develops with that data. And I'm not necessarily saying the consumer gets screwed, but the consumer just wins once. They buy the product that they like and the company wins, wins, 
and wins over and over again in a virtuous cycle for them. There's only a handful of really good examples of this. It's akin to a network effect, but it also has the company in the middle of the payment process. So like an example would be buying a Tesla because no doubt it's a nice car, maybe you like electric cars, those are both interesting reasons to buy a Tesla, but the virtuous cycle comes from the fact that there are cameras all around it. There's 360 degrees of surveillance at all times. On top of that, the car is jam packed with sensors about orientation, about distance, from other cars about how the steering wheel and the gas pedals are and probably whether or not you even have like heated seats and what music you listen to and it's different from other cars in the sense that it's connected through a 5g network and that there's a data privacy policy that you sign up for when you first turn on the car so some of that data is absolutely going back up to the cloud to train the systems especially for someone like me where I have the autonomous driving features those are not perfect they get better better because a lot of us drive with them and we share that data collectively back to Tesla. And guess what? Tesla then sells that product either back to us in a monthly subscription or they sell it to people who buy Teslas in the future as one of the reasons why their car is better than their competitors. So you see how they like, like they're, they're winning. They like win, 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 win. And I do get a car that gets smarter. So I'm not saying I'm losing. I'm not necessarily feeling taken advantage of, but I do kind of feel like, wow, you are gonna like make a lot of money because I'm part of your of your virtuous cycle. And sometimes it, it kind of irks me a little because I'm like, why? I, like you should give me the car for free if I'm sharing all the data. Like honestly, if you if you project Tesla's earnings out far enough, it's almost like they should just give the cars to us for nearly free or something because there is an incredible value in just having all of these Teslas on the road, constantly seeing edge case scenarios and sending that data back to them. And just like the Tesla, the Quest and the Quest Pros, they have cameras all around them looking in all directions. And the Quest Pro is looking back at you. It's just like a Tesla car. It's surveilling your environment, your house, your um, movements, when you're in the metaverse, how you move. And of course, I don't know the exact privacy policy. So to be fair, some of that data about where you are, like inside your house, might stay locally or might not get collected at all. But it certainly could be, and I doubt a lot of people are gonna like look through the whole thing and say, oh, I'd like to return my Quest Pro because you're sharing some data that I don't approve. You know, it's, they're just gonna collect it at some point, right? And for consumers, maybe it's a win. It's a great headset and it helps them be very immersed and it's fun to express through your avatar how your face looks and all of the other features. But also just keep in mind, you're contributing to their virtuous cycle and you're helping Meta build a moat that might be nearly impossible for the other companies to catch up to. So the social and community aspects of the metaverse are the most important things that I think we can focus on. Obviously it's great to like move Amazon into a 3D environment, but like that's just the tip of the iceberg. So I see the metaverse as a potential world community, a place where I can be the citizen of a metaverse first and the citizen of a nation second. And just to quantify from a business point of view, just how much progress is lost from crappy emails, I wanna highlight a McKinsey study on high-skilled knowledge workers where they found that 28% of their work week was spent managing emails. I mean, they estimated that by simply increasing the productivity of social technologies, that we could contribute anywhere from 900 billion to 1.3 trillion in annual value across the commercial sectors in the US. I mean, get out of here. Like whoever, in, I mean, I guess email was like an invention compared to like putting stuff in the mail, but like, it's not oh, just, it's not a good, it's not good communication. And it's been, it's been terrible in so many ways. So real life has always had an important advantage over digital communication. And that is the body language and the subtleties in the way that our bodies and faces emote. Expressive faces have helped inform our ancestors about the people that they interacted with for millions of years. But as opposed to today, for those millions of years, those people actually existed around them. They were not digital representations on Facebook or on Twitter or on any of the other social networks. They weren't even digital video like Zoom. Even though I don't think that we've solved that gap yet, I don't think Slack and email have really made it convenient to communicate in the way that we mean to, I am open to the fact that it's not that it's digital, it's not that it's asynchronous, it is because we haven't yet come up with the technology to really make it 
feel convincing in the brain that somebody else is with you or in the room or that when you want to express excitement, you can just express it and it's just captured instantly. You're not kind of dumbing it down to the highlights that you can actually type out on a keyboard or some sort of variation of capturing a fake piece of what actually happened. And when technology can give us that illusion, I'm open to the idea that the anxiety will go away. I'm open to the idea that we can actually have a world community that kind of feels like we're all in the same room. And there is a super special thing that might be something that we really haven't experienced in human history, and that's when we combine what I would imagine a real-time virtual avatar that emotes correctly, lenses that make me feel like I'm actually in the room with somebody, and the addition of a language translator. Because that, throughout history, has always been an issue that we really could add that layer on top, and that would, that would be awesome. Because symbolically, we've always been able to talk to people from other countries with our faces and our expressions, but we haven't always been able to actually logically form symbolic representations in our voice. And I do love the idea that I can put on a, an Oculus Quest Pro, I can go to some kind of community forum, there can be people there who speak other languages, and we can express exactly what we want to each other with the language barrier being dropped. And in the end, maybe the Quest Pro will make Meta really, really rich. But maybe it's worth it if in the long run, the metaverse lets us experience the best parts of humanity. Okay, and as promised, here is a yellow peacock made of diamonds, small blue lights, industrial lab setting, shiny, unsettling, stylized, hyper-realistic, detailed, unreal engine, 3D render, macro lens, as requested in the last video in the comments section by AK Evans. Thank you so much for giving me this prompt. I hope you enjoy it. And also, if you like this video, you might like our other two YouTube channels, Be Curious Podcast or Be Curious Reactions. See you over on those channels too. Until next time.